My name is Sabrina Huang, and I am a student researcher using bioinformatics to study fly neural cells with a PhD candidate at NYU. Today, I am joined by our guest, Dr. Nan Huang. She is an associate professor at Stanford University in cardiothoracic surgery. She graduated from MIT with a degree in chemical engineering and earned her PhD in bioengineering at UC Berkeley. In this interview, we'll be talking about her early beginnings in research and the highs and lows of her career. Her work focuses on cardiovascular tissue engineering, stem cells, and studying extracellular matrix proteins. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Huang. Happy to be here. So I would love to start this conversation by diving into your early experiences in research. Sure. In life, we think of life as having a number of different uh, serendipitous um, events. And for me, it was essentially serendipity. I was uh, 16 years old at the time, so I was a high school sophomore. And I was thinking about what I was going to do that summer. Now, this is back then before the internet, where if one wanted to learn about summer opportunities, one would go to a library and look through a large um, cabinet of different flyers and postcards related to, diff to different kinds of opportunities. And there I started sifting through uh, what looked like lots of different catalogs and brochures and, and postcards and mailings. And I slowly collected a number of them that I thought would be interesting. And at the time, I really wasn't necessarily interested in going to science, although I did find it academically really interesting. But it really wasn't until I found about a dozen different types of internships. And I thought, hey, I'll just apply to everything and see what I get into. And sure enough, that summer, I had gotten into a summer internship program for high school students through the New York Junior Academy of Sciences, where that program matched me with a hospital um, in Brooklyn under a mentorship of a professor who was really working in the area of cancer. And so through serendipity, that's how I landed in my first uh, summer internship experience in scientific research. You know, and for me, that was really eye-opening. And sometimes I reflect back and think like, well, if I didn't get accepted into that program, where would I be now? That experience really fostered at a very early age my interest in going into science and medicine. I see. Yeah, that's such an interesting start to your research journey. I also wanted to ask, how did you first go about choosing your first research project? And I assume that you also faced some challenges as the beginner. So I would love to talk about that. Sure. Typically, mentors understand the difficulty of getting into research and will intentionally have uh, projects in mind for young students to work on. So it wasn't so much that, you know, I created my own project from scratch because admittedly for very young students like I was, one would not even know how to even go about starting a, a project from scratch. But instead, under, again, the wisdom of mentors, they already have developed a, a project where they know this could be something that could be done in an achievable period of time on a project that already is already moving forward and hopefully isn't going to be filled with lots of, of difficulties along the way. And so in, in that context, my mentor was one who was working in the area of cancer research. And at that time, cancer research was really interesting to me because of a family relative who had had cancer. But I really knew nothing about it from a research perspective. And so it was really the work of this mentor who took the time to teach me from the very beginning, from whether the fundamental aspects of what kinds of cancers and how different kinds of cancers are diagnosed, as well as the technical aspects. And when one reads these introductory papers, nowadays we call them review articles, um, keeping in mind that, you know, back then this was really at the very beginning of the internet. And so if you didn't understand a terminology, well, what you would do is you'd read the review article <laughs> like five or 10 times and hope that every time you read it, something more makes sense. But there really wasn't the internet. You couldn't just Google search it. You couldn't use AI and say, okay, simplify it for me. You were really stuck with, okay, I don't understand this term. Hmm, maybe I can try to look it up in an encyclopedia <laughs> in the library. <laughs> Or I can ask my mentor what that, what, what does it mean? But at the time with those limited resources, we were really left with trying to uh, better understand the material through asking questions from our mentor or trying to read these relatively more introductory articles. I see. Yeah, that's great. It's always really encouraging to hear that even like really established researchers face similar struggles when they were just starting out. But I would love to dive into some of the ups and downs of your research career. 
I would love to ask, like, what are some of the toughest setbacks that you faced during your research journey and how did you overcome sure. them? Well, research is a journey, as you mentioned. It takes repeated efforts. And then I tell my students, that's why it's called research. If you just ask a question, you do it and you find the answer, then you're just like searching. Right? But in mm -hmm. our field, this is called research because oftentimes the first time it doesn't work. And sometimes you have to do a lot of different troubleshooting to try to understand why it's not working. But that is actually something quite expected in this field. Research is not meant for people who want results by tomorrow, right? So it's really meant for people who are willing to stay the long haul where maybe your hypothesis is not really tested for a long time. It's really meant for those kinds of people. But I think one area that is also sometimes underappreciated, especially from younger researchers, is really understanding how difficult the funding landscape is in our in the U.S. and even just globally. Many of us will have interesting ideas, but there are really only limited amounts of funding resources. And essentially, we are all competing for grant funding to be able to carry out those research ideas. And it is highly competitive and it takes what I would call perseverance. Even though our research ideas are essentially based on hypotheses that are, you know, well-grounded, but the fact is that there is some element of subjectivity in terms of how it is perceived. But in that sense, that's, that level of subjectivity almost puts us into areas of like, let's say, performing arts or, or acting, right, where there's always subjectivity from mm -hmm. the person reviewing it. And in doing so, it means that even with what we perceive to be great ideas, they may not necessarily be fundable. And I think to counteract that, it really takes a lot of different skills. One is perseverance to really look at different kinds of funding agencies. And that's something that is a little bit further along compared to for an early investigator. But for young students getting into research, it's also important to have the idea from the beginning that actually research is expensive. Research does require funding to be able to carry out. And a lot of the times, the principal investigator, usually the professor, is the one who is writing these research grants to really get their research uh, funded. That's really interesting. Would you be able to speak about a time where you felt stuck in your research besides just the funding process? And how did you kind of push through those moments of doubt? Sure. Well, in every research project we do, we always have some kind of hypothesis. And that hypothesis is either based on preliminary data or it's based on what is known in the literature. We find ourselves being stuck when we see that our hypothesis is not panning out as we expect. Essentially, we also have to keep an open mind in terms of you know, accepting that, oh, well, maybe our hypothesis was wrong. And, and even though we may have really wanted the hypothesis to turn out one way, the results are the results. And even if the hypothesis was wrong, how can that still be something important for the field to understand? And I think that is sometimes for early researchers, something that's really hard to understand. Like, oh, well, I spent all this time thinking and, and coming up with this hypothesis. It really ought to be what I think it is, but but I think in science, we really have to keep an open mind. We have to change course as as necessary, rather than trying to get stuck in that stage and say, no, no, let's, let's keep testing that hypothesis. We have to just be open and accept that maybe our hypothesis did not pan out the way we thought it would be, but maybe in doing so, it will take us to a different avenue of research. I see. That's great. Yeah. I would also love to ask you a little bit more about your career as well. I know that right now you are an associate professor at Stanford University. So what steps did you take to transition from originally starting off as a student researcher to now earning a PhD and teaching at Stanford? Right. I think for someone who wants to become a professor, it does uh, require understanding really what the job of a professor does. Well, what do professors really do? But really, some of the things that, that drive me into academia are all the things that I find really important in this job and role. One is being able to mentor the next generation, but there are also other elements that maybe are not as flashy, including really writing grants all the time to get our ideas funded. There, There is a balance of both the, the, the fun qualities as well as sometimes the stressful qualities. For people who are interested in research and say like, yes, that's something I want to do. All these great things sound, I want to do it. How do I get into it? In our field, it is very important to get experience in research. And if it still sounds 
fun, right? Because there will be some people who are sort of turned off by like, what? I don't get the answer by tomorrow. <laughs> you know, no. <laughs> yeah. So for those who are willing to stay the long haul and say, wow, I really like research. Yes, it, it is a long haul, but I find it, you know, really fun and I want to keep pursuing it. Then it would then take us to getting a higher education. So usually a PhD to be able to really become knowledgeable and in that sub area of, of research. And even from there, nowadays, it's estimated that only something like 15% of the PhD graduates actually end up going into um, academia. And so it is a really, I would say, tough climate to get into academia. And in part, it's because most departments hire people when they have additional funds or additional space to hire professors or that professors, existing professors are retiring. And that's the reason why there aren't like that many academic jobs available to become a professor. But what I say is really about, again, perseverance, right? Also having great ideas, which is where, you know, being able to get fundable kinds of grants. And thirdly, um, the ability to enjoy that teaching and mentoring experience in a stepwise kind of fashion. And for those who are still very young in their research journeys, um, talking to, you know, mentors who can give them more practical advice in their particular scenario in terms of what could be their next steps. I see. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Did you always see yourself as becoming a professor in the beginning or like how did that evolve over time? Well, getting back to the very beginning about serendipity through that singular research experience back when I was in high school, of which case I actually stayed on in that lab up until graduating high school. So I was in that research lab for about three years. And through that experience, I really enjoyed and appreciated how the research process goes, as well as the time and effort and energy that the mentor really put into me. And through that experience, I felt that I wanted to do the same for the next generation. So that's how I became really interested in, in, in research and wanting to mentor other students. I see. Yeah, it's wonderful to hear how your career evolves. I would also love to ask a couple of questions geared towards students who are just starting out. So in general, what advice do you have for young researchers who often feel really overwhelmed by the complexity of just starting a research project? Sure. So typically, young students just starting out on a research project are not alone per se, right? Meaning that they are working under a mentor and typically the mentor may assign what we call near peer mentors who could be either a graduate student, a postdoc or someone else in the lab who may be actually more available and may be able to be a bridge to the actual mentor. And so it's very important to be able to have the mentor as well as what we call near peer mentors to ask for support if there are things that are not that are not understood. It is usually the case where they are working on a specific part of a much larger project. And in those cases, it's also, you know, helpful to be able to see like the bigger picture. Okay, how does my little project fit into the bigger project that maybe other individuals in the lab are, are, are working on? But I think what is most important is to get support because at a very young stage of one's research career, it's very easy to get discouraged, to be like, oh, you know, this project, I don't really understand what's going on. So it does take time and sometimes explaining something in five or 10 different ways to be like, oh, I finally understand why am I doing this particular experiment or, or, or project. Um, it also, you know, takes, um, as I mentioned, perseverance that even when you understand the project, actually doing the experiments for, again, a very early researcher, one may not be aware of the the nuances. And what I mean by nuances is when carrying out experiments, yes, many of you will have what we call research protocols. I'd explain, okay, step one, do this. Step two, do that. Step three, three, do this. But similar to almost cooking, even when you look at a cooking recipe, two people can follow the exact same recipe and end up with vastly different end products, right? Yeah. And the reason is there are nuances yeah. that are not exactly spelled out in those step-by-step -step protocols that it's not until you really try it out and you realize, oh, actually, if I try it this way, the results look different. If I try it that way, I get this kind of... And so there are these nuances that will take time to really uh, understand and to be able to do an experiment properly. And so it takes perseverance to be able to go through that whole entire process and then ultimately become really technically skilled at doing the experiment. So I would say for young people, get support for things that are, do not seem... Um, easy to understand. 
practice, 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 right? I think the, the third piece you know, of advice is this is one research experience. And you may realize that maybe this particular topic or this kind of field may not be your thing. But it doesn't necessarily mean you should just X out science or research as a future career. Maybe it means try a different kind of research experience that you may find is actually more enjoyable to you. Yeah, that's great. I also did want to ask our final question along the lines of mentorship. How important is it for young researchers to go about finding uh, a, g- a great research mentor for any project? Sure. So, you know, I think good research mentors are ones who are willing to spend the time and the effort and invest. Essentially, it's an investment in that in that student's career almost. And finding mentors who are able to invest by putting them onto a project, maybe under the near peer mentor, like a graduate student or a postdoc. Um, but regardless, even if there's a near peer mentor, the the professor, or the mentor still needs to invest the time to try to understand how the project is going, having that personal interaction, understanding what the student's future goals are and trying to maybe align the research project or maybe other kinds of opportunities, let's say to attend a conference or let's say to submit an abstract or to write a paper, really depending on what that student's long-term goals may be. And so I think those are important qualities of a good research mentor. Admittedly, for younger students, there are many people who want to get research experiences and there are only so many students a laboratory can really take effectively. So I think that I would say being able to get into any lab initially is, is good. Get your foot into the door. And when one has experience and you can put that on your resume that, oh, you volunteered at this lab and you're working on this particular project, that will increase your chances to get subsequent research experiences. So I would say don't feel like, you know, life and death depends on finding the right perfect lab, but really initially get your foot into the door, into any lab, because only by experiencing different kinds of research environments where you understand what kinds of research you might, may or may not be interested in. And then as you get more of those experiences, you'll be able to hone in and then be able to figure out even which kinds of mentors um, from those various experiences you tended to connect better with. Yeah, that is great advice. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Huang. I'm sure that a lot of young researchers really look up to your work. So thank you so much for joining us thank today. Thank you. Happy to be here.